Good morning. I'd like to share two scriptures with you this morning. First one <clears throat> comes from Doctrine and Covenants, section 4, verse 1. Now behold, a marvelous work is about to come forth among the children of men. Therefore, O ye that embark in the service of God, see that ye serve him with all your heart, might, mind, and strength, that ye may stand blameless before God at the last day. Therefore, if ye have desires to serve God, ye are called to the work. For behold, the field is white, all ready to harvest. And lo, he that thrusteth in his sickle with his might, the same layeth up in store that he perish not, but bringeth salvation to his soul. And faith, hope, charity, and love, with an eye single to the glory of God, qualifies him for the work. The second scripture I'd like to share with you this morning comes from the book of Alma, the 12th chapter. One through seven. And now it came to pass that as Alma was journeying from the land of Gideon southward away to the land of Manti, behold, to his astonishment, he met the sons of Mosiah journeying towards the land of Zarahemla. Now these sons of Mosiah were with Alma at the time the angel first appeared unto him. Therefore Alma did rejoice exceedingly to see his brethren. And what added more to his joy, they were still his brethren in the Lord. Yea, and they had waxed strong in the knowledge of the truth, for they were men of a sound understanding, and they had searched the scriptures diligently that they might know the word of God. But this is not all. They had given themselves to much prayer and fasting. Therefore they had the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of revelation. And when they taught, they taught with power and authority, even as with the power and authority of God. And they had been teaching the word of God for the space of 14 years among the Lamanites, having had much success in bringing many to a knowledge of the truth. Yea, by the power of their words, many were brought before the altar of God to call on his name, and confess their sins before him. Pray that the Lord might add his blessing as we study his word this day. I bring you greetings from the little branch of Chilhowee this morning. Wow, are you guys ever blessed with music? That is a real treat for me. We, uh, as many of the little branches, aren't blessed that way. So it's uh, truly a privilege. I have a lot of friends here in this group, but there's also many of you that I don't know. And I'd like to have us focus for just a moment on the first scripture that I read from Doctrine and Covenants. And it says that we uh, need to pursue the work with all our heart, might, mind, and strength. And if we do that, that there's a tremendous promise. And that promise is that we can stand blameless before God at the last day. And I don't know many of you, and I don't know where your lives have been up till now, but I know that I hope that I can stand blameless before God at the last day. I've been blessed with some tremendous examples in my life. Some examples that uh, I think fit the pattern of all heart might, mind, and strength. 
I like to refer to it as being all in. All in for the Lord. About a hundred years after that scripture that I read in Doctrine and Covenants, just exactly a hundred years, that scripture was given in 1829. And in 1929, my ancestors, the first ones that heard of this restored gospel, heard that message preached in power. And they heard that message in the little community of Andes, Montana. Some of you will recognize the name Andes. There was a large family of church members with the name of Andes, and some of them later were involved in Andes Roberts' construction, and they built many, many houses in Independence. But there were several of the Andes family that took homesteads around that community, and they built up a little community, and they had a church there, an RLDS church. And how they ever got a minister to come there in the dead of winter, I don't know. Because it couldn't have been an easy trip, especially not in 1929. But they did. And they were having a week-long preaching series there. And a brother-in-law of my grandparents came to their home and said, you've got to hear the way that this minister shares the gospel. I've never heard anything like it. Well, my grandmother's testimony was that they both came from strong Danish Lutheran families. And at the age of 13, that she had accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. But she said, I'd never really been able to feel saved in the way that they described that I should. And she was a reader, and she read her scriptures, and she said, I continued to find things that didn't fit the pattern of the church that I worshipped in. There was things that, that weren't there, and I wondered about them, and I always sought for more light and truth. And so they decided that they would go and listen to this minister preach, and uh, thankfully my grandmother wrote that testimony down, that her family might have it. And she said, after that first night, I laid awake in bed a long time, pondering over those things that I had heard. Because if this was the truth, it was what I'd sought for. It was what I'd prayed for light and truth. And here it was. If it was really the way this minister said, I'd found true church. She said, I almost prayed it wasn't so because it would be so disruptive to our family and how hurt the parents would be and the grandparents if we left the church that we were raised in. But she said, after that first night, we couldn't stay away. And we continued to go to that series the whole week. Even the last night when the temperature was 30 below zero. This was in 1929. They had three little children from about two to six. They bundled those little children up and put them in a sled, hooked it behind a team, and they went to the little church to listen to the message. That's dedication. It's being all in. I am so grateful for their choice because I might have settled for less. I don't know. I was taught this gospel from the time I can remember. And I don't know what I would have done had I not been given it that way. So I don't know what the course of each of your lives has been, but I, I feel sure there's a reason that we're here today. I don't believe much in coincidences. I think the Lord has a plan for each of our lives. And when they cross, there's a purpose. And so I hope that I can share some things today that help us on our walk. The sons of Messiah were effective where others had failed because of preparation. 
when you read the way that they prepared, it's plain why when they taught, they taught with the power and authority of God. Because he blessed them. Because they came before him and prepared. And I think the Lord wants that in our life as well. He wants us to spend time alone with him. And he also wants us to come together on days like today. The scripture says that we have embarked. And when I think of the word embarked, I think of going on a journey. Perhaps loading up in a vehicle or a boat or some conveyance and starting out on a trip. And when we start out on a trip, other than perhaps if it's one of those when you're just out of high school and there's really no purpose, you're just having a road trip. But other than that, we have a destination. And at the end of our journey, we plan on reaching a goal. And I hope that each of us have a goal. And I hope it's the kingdom. In 2014, some big changes came about in my life and the life of my family. I've uh, always been involved in agriculture, raising cattle and, and also a, a construction business because sometimes the farm doesn't pay the bills. And so uh, in 2014, I had an accident. I won't go into a lot of details about that accident, but the effect was that it left me paralyzed from the waist down. I had a burst fracture and a piece of the bone pinched my spinal column my spinal cord. And uh, I found myself in intensive care and after having a couple of operations, they were having trouble getting my gut to wake up. My intestinal processes weren't working. And perhaps looking back, I may have followed some advice that was questionable, but I was told that I should go ahead and eat a meal. And I've always been a good eater, always worked hard physical work and worked outside and always had a good appetite, so I ate a meal. Bad idea. A few hours later, I had never been so sick. And without burdening the story, I ended up with the tube through the nose and into my stomach. And I found myself in great misery laying there pouring my heart out to the Lord in the middle of the night. My family had brought a CD player and there was some CDs there and the one that was playing was my brother George Allen. Some of you might have known him. Brother George had a gift with the guitar and was singing. He didn't read or write music, but the Lord would give him songs. And he would learn them and memorize them. And I'd shared many songs around the campfire reunions with Brother George. And uh, I was laying there pouring my heart out to the Lord and this CD was playing. And I wasn't paying any attention to what was on. I was just miserable. And I don't think I was really complaining, but I was just telling the Lord all the things that I couldn't do anymore. That I'd always done like he didn't know. And finally I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Right at that precise moment, the song came on and it was a song that I was very familiar with. I'd heard George sing it many times. I'd sung it with him. And the song was Feed My Sheep. And I had my answer. That's what the Lord wanted me to do, feed my sheep. And I said, but Lord, that's not my gift. I build things. I raise cows. That's, that's not my gift. The Lord doesn't call us to that which is our strength at least not always. 
And as I mentioned, we are in the cattle raising business, and I, and I hope that this doesn't offend you, but I'm going to make some comparisons today to that business compared to our walk with the Lord, because it's what I know. We spend all summer filling the hay barn with hay. And we do that so that we'll have something to feed the cows in the wintertime. Now, when we get the hay barn full and we're prepared, it doesn't keep winter from coming. But we're ready for it, or at least mostly ready. Now, I'm sure that you have desires to serve the Lord because you wouldn't be here today if you didn't. And the scripture that I read says that if you have desires to serve, you are called to the work. So I think each of us is called to the work. We're called to be disciples, called to be witnesses. And I hope that you prepare just as the sons of Messiah did. Because if you do, you will not only be prepared to witness to others, but you will be prepared for those things that come in your own life. Because we have certain things that happen in the course of our lives, certain challenges, certain trials, certain crises, and it will help you to be prepared. And the things that the Lord laid on my heart that we should do as we prepare is to draw close to him in prayer and develop a prayer life. That we should learn to be generous givers and humble receivers. And that we should let him lead. You know, so many times we try to take the lead and don't let him be at that place where he needs to be. After we uh, finish our preparations, will it keep the crisis from coming in our life? No. Will we really be ready for them? No. But we'll be a lot closer. And we will... Be richly rewarded for whatever effort we have made to prepare. The Lord will bless us accordingly. The goal in the beef production business is to raise the most pounds of healthy beef that we can raise on the resources that we have. You have to have an end goal. Every business has an end goal. And that's our goal. As our goal as disciples is to be witnesses. And I believe that we are to use whatever tools the Lord has given us. And we heard some marvelous tools here today. Some people that are really gifted. You know, that's the only thing that I'd be more scared to do than speak, is sing. And they're using those gifts to witness And we are all called to draw others to Christ with whatever tools he gives us. We are called to bear fruit. Bearing fruit in the beef business consists of this. We want a cow to conceive on time and we want her to raise a healthy calf and we want her to do it every year. And if she can't do that, You get her at McDonald's. It sounds cruel, but it's just the business. It's, It's just the way it is. And that is bearing fruit. And we are called to bear fruit. The Lord doesn't want baggage. He wants fruit bearers. We work on our genetics in our cow herd all the time. It's something we pay a lot of attention to. 
And one of the things that we constantly work on is disposition. We don't want to have to fight a cow every time we need to do something with her. And so we really work on that. Because that cow has a better chance of bearing fruit if she has a good disposition. In people, we call it attitude. One of the things about two or three days after my accident that I decided was that the only thing that I controlled in this whole process was my attitude. And I made a stand in the way of whatever I could do to be a witness to somebody else. So I encourage you that as you go about your witnessing, to do it with a cheerful attitude. Do it with a cheerful countenance, a way that draws others and not repels them. In the beef business, we sometimes have a heifer that will raise a really, really good first calf. Maybe that calf will be a lot better than the rest of her peers in that group. But then sometimes when we put her back with the bull to conceive to raise the second calf, she doesn't. And she comes in in the fall open, we call it. No calf in her. Well, when that happens, she's lost from the herd. Because they need to produce a calf every year. Witnessing can be a lot like that sometimes. Sometimes we start with a big excitement. We're all in for the Lord. And I know you've seen this happen. And we go out and we start fast and we, we witness to others and we try to bring others to Christ and something happens. Our feelings get hurt or somewhere along the way something turns us. And just like that heifer that doesn't have a calf the second year, we, we wander off. We're no longer good witnessing tools for the Lord. We've lost our way and we wander off into other paths. And we're lost to the work. Remember that we are identified with Christ. We as believers are identified with Christ, and we are going to be a witness wherever we are. We can choose to be a good witness or a mediocre witness or a bad witness, but we are going to witness to others because they identify us as Christians and as saints. The beef business is about longevity. It's about getting a cow to produce a healthy calf for many years, year after year. Endurance is what we call it in witnessing work as believers. We are called to endure. We are called not to get our feelings hurt. We are called to be honest with our brothers and sisters. We are called to come together and to reason together. And as believers, that is one of the most important things that we don't always follow is to endure. Because you see, that heifer that produced so much that she couldn't sustain herself on the nourishment that she received was lost to the herd. And we too if we don't stay close to the Lord, that we continue to draw that spiritual food from Him, we also can be lost to the work for lack of nourishment and wander off into a path that's our own. 
We have to be careful spiritually not to run faster than we have strength. That strength needs to be renewed. Another thing that happens in the beef business is we would like a cow to produce as much milk as her calf can possibly use, that he'll be as big as possible in the fall. But we don't want any extra. We want it to be just enough, however much he can use. Because extra in the udder causes swelling and inflammation and problems, and it eventually it gets bad enough, it can, it can spoil the udder completely and the cow won't be any good. I liken this to the Lord's material blessings to us. The challenges of an affluent society, and we are an affluent society, whether we like that title or not, the poorest financially among us is the envy of most of the world. And the challenges in an affluent society are learning to keep pride out of our lives. If the Lord blesses us with more than we can learn how to share, pride very likely enters in many times. And it just seems like wealth and pride go together many times. We see it in the scriptures. We have to learn to share that wealth that the Lord has given us. Because if we allow pride to creep in, just as in the beef business, we can end up with a cow that's no longer productive because the udder's been spoiled, that pride can render us as unfit witnesses. And eventually, if left unchecked, that pride will render us unfit for the kingdom. And remember, the kingdom is our goal. Pride can cause us to elevate ourselves to the position that God must occupy in our lives. Remember, he needs to be at the pinnacle all the time, every day. And that's true in our personal lives. It's true in our marriages. And it's true in our nation. God needs to occupy that highest place. We have witnessed in our nation where God has in the last couple of generations been pushed out of our institutions along with his Ten Commandments along with our Ten Commandments. And we have substituted the wisdom of man. The results of that is that we have watched as disrespect for God has turned into disrespect for the law that's based on his commandments. And now just very recently in the last few years, we've seen it turn into disrespect for those who try to live by those commandments and even disrespect for those who uphold the law. <clears throat> I'd like to take you for a moment to the Lord's Prayer. It's something that almost all Christian groups can agree upon, at least most of it. And it uh, says right near the first part of that prayer, hallowed be thy name, holy. God is holy. And he wants to be treated as such. He wants to be at the pinnacle of our lives. He wants us to be reverent to him. The second line is, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That, brothers and sisters, is our goal, the kingdom of God on earth. I hope that all of us have as a goal to be a part of that kingdom, to be able to live 
in that group. In order to do that, there's an indication there that we have to subordinate our will to that of the Heavenly Father. We have to want His will to be done even before we ask for our daily bread or those things that we want or those things we think we need. Is it simple to subordinate our will to that of, the, of our Heavenly Father? It seems like it should be. Is it largely ignored and forgotten sometimes? Sometimes maybe even by us. There's a couple of things that I'd like to suggest that you consider as we think about our walk with the Lord and where we are in the world in this day we find ourselves. How do we create the environment that the kingdom of God might come on this earth? What can we do? I always like to go back to something that's constructive, something we can build on. The first thing that came to me as I prayed about this is that we can start treating each other with respect. You know, there's been a lot of respect lost in the last generation or two in our country. And we need to go back to treating each other with respect. In Charles Derry's autobiography, there's a, there's a line that really touched me about respect. And if you've read his book, it's kind of a journal, really. It's almost like reading a diary sometimes about his travels and his ministry in different places. And he closed out, he's talking about closing out a year and starting a new year and there had been a lot of contention in the church. There had been some strong, strong disagreements among some of the priesthood. And he closed that year by saying something like, he talked about this contention and then he said, and I continue to hold my brothers in high regard, assuming that their intentions are as honorable as my own. That, brothers and sisters, if we had that attitude when we have difficulties between us, in our groups, in our families, it would change things. That's respect. The other thing I would suggest is that we quit being so selfish. You know, I hope that you were taught that lesson at your mother's knee or that somebody taught you to share your toys. It sounds so basic that it sounds almost silly. But you know, selfishness is at the root of so many of our problems. We see it ruin, ruining individual lives. We especially see it ruining marriages. But we see it tearing families apart because of someone's selfishness. And certainly we've seen it in our church. Selfishness is not of the Lord. And when we learn to purge it from our lives, we will be on the road to the kingdom. I'd like to ask for you to do one thing in this coming year. I'd like to ask for you to commit to some time in this year taking one of those great church books, one of those great books of testimony, and reading it. Taking time away from all our electronics and all our busy lives and sit down and read one of those books. Whether it's the one I referenced about Brother Charles Derry, whether it's J.J. Cornish or Joseph Smith Jr., there's a great, great book about the life of Emma Smith. There's a lot of them. But I'd like for you to read one of those books and ponder upon the sacrifices that those early saints were willing to make. Because as you ponder on that, it will change something about you. 
it will cause you to consider what are you willing to sacrifice? What am I willing to sacrifice? Would I have done what they did? And when we consider that, and when we apply it to our lives, it helps us to get rid of pride. It helps us to push that pride out of our lives that we might be a more effective witness. It will humble you to read of their sacrifices and their dedication. I'd like to close with one scripture. And this is a scripture that all my life I have thought, no, can't do it. It's not possible. I'm working on it. And it comes from the book of James. And it says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into many afflictions, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. In closing, I'd like to share one testimony with you. This testimony, as many of mine do, involves a horse and a hunting trip because I spent a lot of time doing that at one time. And this particular time, my brother and I were in the mountains and the horse that I was riding, I had a, we had a pack horse and a saddle horse that we rode. And we had ridden our riding horses a lot, and they were tired. So one day I took my pack horse to give the other one a break because he'd been standing around eating. And he was what we called bomb-proof. He just, he just didn't blow up. You could do about anything, and he was just calm. And I'm sure the Lord had a hand in that, why I was on him that day, but we came to a place where there was some brush, a tree across the trail, and on my left side was a mountain. I was, the trail was tied up to the mountain, so I got off on the wrong side. And that was not a big deal, but not as familiar, not just automatic. And as I, I got the brush out of the way and I went to get back on, and my foot slipped out when I went to step up and I hung in the stirrup. And I was wearing big pack boots that had spikes on the bottom of them for traction in the snow. And when that back foot slipped out and that stirrup turned, I was hung as tight as could be with that stirrup against those spikes. And it seemed like an eternity, and I suppose it was a few seconds that I hung there. But I reached behind me and I tried for all I was worth to get a finger hold on something to lift myself up off the ground enough to get the weight off that stirrup so my foot would come loose. And I could not reach anything. That mountain fell away behind me and I could not get any leverage to push myself up off the ground. I flopped around there for a minute, and I'm sure the Lord gave me the blessing to, for my foot to come loose. And you know, I, I think I thanked him at the time, and I went on, and, and I haven't thought that much about that testimony over the years. Once in a while, I remember it. And as I was preparing for a sacrament service a while back, I thought about that testimony. And it came to me then that that it's just like the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I could not lift myself from that predicament I was in. I could not get a hold of anything to pry myself off the ground. And brothers and sisters, that is where we are with our sin. If we don't give it to Jesus Christ, if we don't let him lift us from that fallen state that we are in, we are without hope. But Jesus has offered 
that he will take that sin. He will take those burdens if we will give them to him. God bless you, brothers and sisters. It's a privilege to have been with you today. <laughs>